Okay, so we're going to make a start. Um, so thank you for the people joining us and welcome to uh, Meet the Science Artists of the EGU General Assembly, where each of the four artists uh, not in residence uh, featured at this year's EGU General Assembly will be discussing the work they made during the conference and how they brought together the worlds of science and art. My name is Simon Clark. I'm the EGU's Committee Programs Coordinator. Um, in today's webinar structure, we have four speakers, each will have given a slot to discuss their art, followed by a Q&A session after all speakers have finished. For the question, please enter at any time by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, We can also upvote questions and questions with the most votes are more likely to be asked, although we'll try and get through all questions anyway. Um, note that this webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is EU Geosciences. Um, so now I want to introduce our guest speakers today. We have Andy Emery, who is a creative writer, Kelly Stanford, who is an artist, um, a science communicator, and also a convener of the General Assembly Arts and Science EOS sessions, Priyanka Das Rajkakati, who is a digital artist, Stacy Phillips, who is a photographer. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, and to start off, we'll have Kelly begin. So Kelly, could you uh, want to take over? Hello. Right. So I'm Kelly Stamford. I'm a science communicator and researcher at the University of Hull. Uh, as Simon just mentioned, I also convened the Exploring the Art Science Interface session at this year's EGU conference. Uh, and I was also one of the artists in residence who basically did portraits of many of the conveners and speakers at this year's conference. So I'd like to just quickly go through some of the art that I produced. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, so this poster I, I created to um, advertise my session. So if you missed it, this session was all about combining art and science together. So it was mainly highlighting collaboration between the two, uh, showcasing how science communication projects used art as their medium. Um, and it's really interesting because it, it gave everyone a chance from outside of like even geosciences to, you know, get into EGU and show what they'd been working on. So we had um, at the start about 30 people um, submit um, abstracts showing their, you know, their projects and work and stuff um, that went down to, I think, 27. Uh, yeah, we had a very wide range of different topics covered uh, throughout the geosciences and different mediums showcased. We had people making um, like these science quilts. So each little patch of this quilt represented a bit of, of their own like research. Uh, we had photographers showcasing their astrophotography. We had people sculpting waves out of glass. It's really incredible to see so many different, you know, sci artists and scientists who had collaborated with artists all in the one place, uh, you know, discussing what they'd done. And it was really nice to see them then after the conference meet up and discuss further collaboration um, and even possibilities of coming back next year to showcase what had come out of these brand new collaborations as well. Um, I was also on the EDI colouring book project panel. So I was producing these, these like colouring pages um, of various like attendees and speakers at this year's conference to show the diversity and give more representation to everyone, basically. I just thought it's a really nice you know, way to get people out of their comfort zone and start, you know, making art and stuff. And it's also quite relaxing as well. Uh, um, let me just move on to some of the portraits that I created during this year's conference. So we have um, Daniel Parsons on the left, AKA my big boss at Hull. Um, 
he's also the head of the geomorphology division at EGU. So, yeah, no, no pressure, no pre <laughs> pressure painting him this year. Then we've got Christopher Jackson, who is an amazing volcanic researcher. He was one of our great debate panelists this year. And um, all around, really nice guy. I absolutely loved creating this portrait. And I'm so happy he liked how it turned out as well. Uh, I also randomly picked out people at the conference as well. Uh, so we've got a researcher here who's at her research desk uh, analyzing soil samples for signs of micro, you know, microbiology um, processes such as like trapped um, chemicals and stuff like that. Um, and just wanted to showcase some of their work desks because a lot of times you don't actually see people's you know, desks and stuff like that. So I wanted to just show some of the stuff that was in their office in this, you know, in this portrait. Um, and also because it was uh, Earth Day, I wanted to do a painting of Greta Thunberg as well, which you can see on the left here. Uh, that killed me hand <laughs> doing all those details because I, I had to do it really quickly in like 24 hours to get it out for the next day. Um, but it's fun nevertheless. I think it came out pretty well for you know the time spent on it. And then we got another great debate panelist uh, to our right. Uh, she did a lot of stuff around Antarctica and ice sheets and stuff. So I wanted to show her battling the elements uh like this great explorer basically and the person on the left is one of the students from my institute who was showing her first paper at this year's EGU I did this uh, open call throughout the institute uh, basically say hey if you fancy a free portrait hit me up um and her research seems really interesting it's basically analyzing these worms if you're wondering what they are they're basically a species of um, sea worm. Um, so I wanted to show that as well and how they influence the habitat in those areas, in these coral reefs and their beds, basically. Um, yeah, I should have paired a few more um, <laughs> illustrations because I did do quite a lot, but I, I think I'll use this time to also highlight some of my other projects as well because of quite diverse, quite interesting. So another thing that I've done that I actually exhibited at last year's EGU conference was this card game Resilience, which I created with uh, the help of Dr. Chris Skinner. You may know him uh, from being the head of the Games Night uh, at EGU. Um, so we worked together at the University Hall to create this um, competitive card game, which aims to try and teach people about flood resiliences, flood risk, and also climate change as well. So the whole idea is you'll have two people facing off against one another, uh, trying to build up their flood defences while also sending various natural disasters uh, <laughs> to your opponent, uh, and just seeing who can make the most solid um, flood defence. Um, <laughs> and obviously figure out <laughs> who's not as good as it. But the interesting thing about this is we actually did it as part of the study as well. So there's actually three versions of this game. So one's got this full color artwork. There's another version that's just got line art. And there's another version that's got no artwork at all. It's just text and stuff. And basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to play test it and see which card game was more effective at making people retain the knowledge from the cards. So each card actually has facts and information about each, you know, flooding subject. And you kind of need to remember this in order to effectively play the game. And we found out from the data that we took that there was actually a significant difference between people playing this full art version and people playing the line art and text only versions. We found out that the line art version was actually the least effective with the text only version coming up second. And then way ahead with knowledge retention was this full art version. 
So basically we've proved that having art alongside research uh, and you know, learning materials is extremely effective <laughs> at people, you know, getting people to actually remember the information on the subject and stuff. Um, yeah, so I'll show you a bit more about this game actually. Um, so here's just some uh, pictures of people playing, play testing it in mass at various campuses and stuff. We might try and um, get various communities, different age groups to play it just to make sure that we had a solid data set. It was quite difficult because at the time we started play testing this game, unfortunately COVID hit. So due to you know social distancing and stuff like that, uh, we couldn't run as many of these sessions as we wanted to. But luckily what we did was we um, digitized the entire card game, all the learning materials, like the rules and stuff, and also the questionnaires that had to be filled in before and after. And people could basically sign up to the study, download and print the materials off, play test the game, and then submit the data later. And thankfully we had participants from all over the world. We had like, I think 25 countries or something ridiculous take part in this study, uh, play testing the game and sending back data. So thankfully we we're able to confirm our suspicions that actually, yeah, the you know, card games are extremely effective and it does matter if you've got art on them or not. Um, and at the moment I'm currently transferring onto a PhD. We're going to, going to produce a follow-up game and the next game is actually going to be a collaborative one. So the next part is seeing whether the style of game matters. So basically competitive versus collaborative, what will influence knowledge uptake more? Um, so yeah, that, that's going to be quite fun. Um, yeah, um, I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Kelly. Um, yeah, great. Um, I have actually played Resilience before at an EDU uh, General Assembly, and I remember I actually really enjoyed it. But I'm well, also the prototype one that was. That was the um, the pre version. So another key aspect was like the entire game production process, just like making these prototypes, taking them out taking them to the, you know, various groups in the Institute and play testing it and seeing what was, you know, more effective. I mean, based on feedback we got in those early play tests and especially at EGU actually, that's the reason why the cards look extremely different to what they did yeah. at EGU in, I think it was 2020 or maybe before that actually. No, no, yeah, uh, 2019, sorry. Um, yeah, so, based on you know feedback and stuff like that, people wanted to see more of the artwork and stuff. So basically we thought, right, the entire card's gonna be the artwork. <laughs> and I actually put it down for better. So yeah, that, that's probably a, a great example of where, you know, collaborative research at EGU has come in extremely helpful for projects. Yeah. Um, no, I remember it. I found it really interesting as well, but at the same time, I've had scientists as well, so I'm probably quite biased. But, yeah. Um, right, so we're going to move on to our second speaker now, uh, Andy Embury, if you'd like to take the virtual floor. Cool, so hi everyone, I'm Andy Emery. I'm a geologist working in the offshore wind industry, uh, looking at wiggly lines on geophysics. Um, but in my spare time, I also like to amongst other things, uh, write uh, prosaic, poetic, uh, creative words uh, on numerous things that are important to me, um, mainly including landscapes at some point, because most of what I do involves landscapes to some degree. So this year I was one of the artists not in residence, um, at uh, the virtual EGU 21. Um, so my uh, kind of aim of this um, uh, post or role as one of the artists not in residence um, was to communicate science through creative writing. 
Um, and communicating science is a very difficult thing to do because uh, science isn't particularly emotive in how it uh, words or how it uh, puts across uh, scientific ideas. So that, uh, that lack of emotion can actually uh, go some way to hamper the way that uh, science is communicated. So by creating this uh, emotive um, writing, uh, I hoped to uh, connect um, scientists and non-scientists because once we have this emotional connection, it becomes stronger and people can then begin to understand why what we do is important and how uh, geosciences uh, can uh, effectively uh, help us with uh, getting to a more sustainable future. So my actual writing process began with uh, finding a topic. So this was uh, quite difficult to do because uh, EGU is massive. There are tens of thousands of scientists all presenting uh, fascinating research. So the way I went about finding a topic was basically I put posts on Twitter and encouraged people to get in touch with me, but also browsed through the program and tried to find uh, topics that interested me. So once I found a topic and I'd spoken to the author um, about whether they were happy with me uh, writing something, um, I then had to really read um, what they were writing um, or read or look at their presentations and try and understand the science that they were doing. Um, this is very difficult in some uh, cases because there's a lot of science out there that just blows my mind. Uh, there's a lot of people doing incredible things that I don't have the slightest idea um, how to begin. So that was really, really difficult, actually, and actually surprised me how, um, how difficult I found it, um, because basically I wanted to write something that was both um, creatively uh, interesting, but also scientifically correct. And then once I understood the science, you know, I'd probably... You know, go make a cup of coffee or just step away from things for a bit and then uh, essentially just start writing and let my imagination flow and convert what I'd learned into something more emotive. So there are quite a few different topics that I wrote about um, I think I wrote uh, eight or nine pieces in total and so this quote uh, was put together on a nice image by Hazel Gibson um, and she uh, looked at all my work and then and matched them up to some nice images. So here we have an example of some of the work that I did. And this came from a piece writing about how uh, changes in uh, tectonic plate motion have kind of been reanalyzed in recent years. And so that was a really interesting piece of work. And then I also wrote about the conference experience itself because this year and last year, unfortunately, a lot, lot of us, um, well, all of us were unable to go to Vienna um, and the conference in Vienna is such a magnificent experience and I have so many fond memories of being there. So I kind of wanted to take those memories of the actual conference experience and um, write about them and try and share with everyone the conference experience. So I'll just do a quick reading um, on a piece, the first piece that I wrote, which is called White Blossom. Um, and this was about uh, my memories of arriving in Vienna and going to the conference center. White Blossom. From on the wing, a look out over spring, distant alpine giants sprinkled with confectioner's sugar snow, delicious and tempting, like the window of a becker eye. The subdued silence of the Sunday S-Bahn split by scientists converging by the baggage claim, transported down the Iron River to be de deposited around Vienna through the distributary channels of the U-Bahn. City streets, a surprisingly savage spring sunshine, huge shadows, crosswalks, boutiques and boulevards, suits, refuse collection, roadworks. I meander through block and block, making my way towards the conference center 
bleary, a miscommunication over coffee supplies. I lurch along, following my nose towards an en route cafetiere to jolt my brain into action, followed by a breakfast pretzel to replenish vital salts and soak up last night's catch up with our friends. My path takes me to the arteries of the city, pulsing with transit, first below the bridged s bahn and the OBB between Handelskai and Treisengasse, then circling on a concrete thermal above the busy dual carriageway to soar over the Donau on the Brigittenauer Brücke. The roaring autobahn provides the final spaghetti of concrete to cross before being released into Donau Park. The suddenness of space as I step out from between the blocks onto Brigittenauer Brücke shocks my system, exposed into a sweltering blue sky, a continental high pressure sun, a dry scent of rubber and alpine breeze. Below me, pearlescent flux, an amorphous opal thread woven under bridges, between streets, past towering spires, and around pleasure park playground aisles, languorous but full of potential energy and suspense, the Donau flows, altered course but constant presence through geological time. The piece of the park, its melodic blackbird symphony, warblers perched on ornamental bushes, azalea and acer, is slowly underscored by a growing tremor, a tremblement de terre of 15,000 international geosciences approaching the prismatic brutalist Austria center. White blossom excoriating in the spring morning light, apple and cherry and pear, lining the past that bod through trimmed meadows. A final ramp takes me under the arch of the Saturn Tower to arrive on Earth with Earth scientists awake and alive and ready for the first day of the General Assembly. So that kind of gives you an idea of the things that I was writing about and, and kind of a nice example of my writing style. So if you want to read more about my writing, you can go to my website, uh, doggerbankartcollective.wordpress.com. Um, all of my uh, EGU uh, work is there in the post called Flock Roundup, but there's also lots of other posts um, that you can read about lots of other different things. Um, and a lot of my work is uh, saved there in various forms. If you just want to read the actual artist in residence posts, you can go to the EGU blog, the geolog, and look at the artist in residence category, and all of my work is also saved there. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Um, I actually found that quite relaxing listening to that read. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speaker, uh, which is Priyanka, if you'd like to uh, begin. So hi everyone, I'm quite excited to be here to present my work during the EGU this year. I was actually selected last year, but because of COVID, I was not able to really be very productive. So this year was a welcome change and the interaction was quite fantastic. I found uh, abstracts from very different domains uh, in science and let's move on to it. So I am a PhD student yeah, so by profession, I'm an aerospace engineer. I just finished my PhD from Toulouse, to Peru, but I have been involved in a lot of uh, art science projects. And recently, the artist residency, and I was also a crew artist during an analog uh, simulation mission of an astronaut simulation. Um, a moon gallery project for sending something to the moon in the coming years. And uh, digital art ship concept. So what drives me is space. It just makes you dream so much. So this, just to show, this was a painting that was, that was the first painting in space by the astronaut Alex Eleonor. And then there's Thomas Pesquet, who played his saxophone solo, just to show that how art and culture are an integral part of our lives, even for something as technical as an astronaut job. So moving on to my contributions for EGU. Um, this was a commission by a scientist from ESA who's collaborating with NASA on a joint cooperation on hyperspectral imagery. The, so my medium of, uh, of uh, drawing is for, for EGU was through my graphical tablet. So I, this illustration was done in maybe two hours, but it took me one entire month to get get it uh, validated by ESA and NASA for the usage of the logos. That's also one thing that 
I found was a barrier in science art even today. But thankfully, it uh, worked out. And I was able to actually show this drawing during one of my recent art um, science conferences. Next, uh, this was an interesting collaboration I had with someone who's trying to do air quality monitoring in Africa. Uh, as an artist, it's quite difficult sometimes to strike the right balance between what you can depict, what you cannot, your politics, so many things. Uh, so for me, this was a very interesting experience in just doing uh, what just producing what I wanted to produce and not really worrying too much about um, everything that could take it under. Next, uh, again, another thing that was a bit uh, not comfortable drawing was this map of India, which is the territorial boundaries of India are questioned by several different, depending on who you're asking. So I said, okay, fine, I'm from India, so let's just use the map that's uh, provided by the government. And this, um, this artwork is basically to show how uh, the models you're using for air, air uh, quality monitoring in India are based on models that are too organized and based on uh, Europe or America. And it's hyper organized in these places, while in India, it's, the situation is a bit more chaotic. So you need to keep that in mind while making your models. And this one is a personal favorite. I made it in collaboration with Chrisong von Hype, who also won an award for his research. And it shows how you find the same structures from be it in the macroscopic scale or in the microscopic scale. And so everything which is in the circle, these are uh, images from um, uh, Christoph's own work. And I tried to fit it into a composition uh, in a microscopic scale. Apart from EGU, um, some of my other projects right now are this exhibition I have called Star Cities Organized Worlds, where I'm taking mathematical equations and converting it into artwork, in this case, equations of planetary movements. Um, the Moon Gallery project, so what's in blue here is that tiny bit of uh, artwork that I'll be sending to the moon. I can give you more information later if you want. The digital art spaceship of which my uh, work was a part and yeah, my analog astronaut mission during which I also created some artwork, which I'll be again presenting during another conference. And this is, uh, an art project that I have as, a, as an art curator. So the idea was to invite other artists to, con to um, contribute some work on the topic of women in aerospace. And we got about 30 different um, pieces about how different communities perceive space in their own communities, so in Africa, in India, in the United States. It was quite a healthy mix of artworks. It's quite interesting to see what people had to say and a uh, project in Antarctica next year um, because of COVID got delayed. So I still have some time for preparing it. And if anyone wants to collaborate, I'd be happy to talk. So thank you so much for your attention. I would really like to thank EGU for giving this opportunity. And if you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram. I just recently created it. So not too many work pieces on it right now, but I invite you to follow me there. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Um, a lot of projects are going on to go there. That's quite exciting. Um, we have a final speaker before I move on to questions, and that is Stacey. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, my name's uh, Stacey Phillips. I'm a geologist and uh, lecturer at the University of Hull currently. Um, and I was one of the four artists in residence this year. I was also, like Priyanka, uh, supposed to be one of the artists in residence last year, um, but I, uh, managed to do that online as well. So actually the photos that you can see on the image here, on the screen here, are my Lego photos that I did for EGU last year. Um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a Lego photographer. And the idea behind my work is that I wanted to create an image um, for researchers to use, um, I guess primarily as a way of advertising their talks at EGU. They could use them in their talks just to create a 
really engaging image that people could kind of uh, be attracted to, to their amazing research. And Lego has a fantastic quality for allowing that kind of instant engagement. It puts people's smiles on people's faces and it kind of, you're automatically interested in it. Um, so yeah, so these, these are some of the photos that I made, made from last year. Um, so everything from kind of satellite monitoring to rain monitoring, to volcanoes, to climate stripes. Um, and this is me in my, in my bedroom last year with my Lego top on uh, and my kind of workstation. Um, and then, yeah, very nicely, EG invited me back again this year um, as part of this kind of, this, this bigger group of us four. And these are a selection of some of the images that I've made this year. Um, so I primarily advertised myself on Twitter uh, and I was overwhelmed with people uh, wanting their abstracts turned into images. And I profusely apologize if, I, if uh, I never got back to you and you sent me a message. There were a lot more people than I, I imagined would get in contact with me. Um, and thankfully I was able to kind of, I was able to cr create quite a lot of content because I had a, a quicker turnaround for being able to kind of build a set and take a photo of it and, and get people's approval and get it out there so that people could use it to advertise their talks. Um, so yeah, we had everything from, again, we've got ancient peatlands. Um, this was a, a bit of a take on the, the term bed forms. So I've got three Lego figures uh, in their pajamas, um, enjoying various different bed forms, uh, depending on how turbulent the water is around these, these uh, marine features. Um, yeah, forest fires. This is a depiction of the Andes, uh, the Peruvian Andes, where um, a glacial runoff is causing toxicity in some of the glacial lakes there um, because of the, the rocks that are now becoming exposed. Um, and yeah, my, my images, they tend to be kind of depictions of geologists or earth, earth scientists in the field doing their field work uh in the lab they're things of landscapes uh but then some of them like this one in the bottom left this is a representation of the magnetosphere and uh yeah curves and angles are quite hard to make in lego uh, so i was pretty proud that i kind of came up with something that that might uh depict what the what the kind of magnetosphere might look like in the the kind of diagrams that you get in textbooks um, but yeah, really fun to make um, and quite simple to make actually. I, I enjoy sharing kind of behind the scenes uh, shots of what the final images are. So this is this is the kind of the, the set that I made that I made of the Peruvian Andes. So I managed to get two two slightly different images. Um, I was contacted by two people from the same kind of broader research group, both asking for them. So I was like, I can use the same mountain set up for that. Um, and literally the background is a blue, is a blue top and the, the, uh, to make the water in the foreground, I've just got a sheet of colored paper covered in uh, cling film and it, it kind of picks up the, the light quite nicely. So really simple setups to make quite effective images, I think. Uh, I did manage to get outside for one of my photos, so primarily I, I, I take my Lego minifigures out into the wider world and show how they interact with it. Um, but yeah, I managed to managed to get a, a good day to go outside and, and do this little depiction of uh, a researcher in Australia measuring uh, pollen um, from their little uh, measuring station. Um, and then I think this one is probably the favorite image that I that I made this year. So this was depicting um, Felix Reed's work where he um, he's looking at how the the Larkasy eruption in in Germany, I think it was about seventeen thousand years ago, how uh, ancient civilizations responded to that, and then how we can use that to kind of uh, predict and project how civilizations might react to bigger natural or equivalent natural phenomena in the future. Um, and so I, I found some images of a, of a volcanic eruption going off. 
I kind of built a little volcano in the foreground. And this is, these are just boxes. Like there's no high, you know, high tech set up here. This is on my screen. I have some boxes, I have some paper. I've kind of layered it through and I, I've kind of taken this shot. And then in post-production, I kind of made this look like it was ancient. And then these are, these are my futuristic, futuristic peoples with their kind of neon, neon clothes and their technology. Um, and yeah, I think this is this is one of the most the more interesting images that I managed to make this year. So quite happy with that. But yeah, it was uh, this was this was my home studio with bits and pieces. You can see the remains of the magnetosphere over there and boxes and boxes and boxes of Lego. Which actually, the fact that I wasn't in Vienna made it a lot easier to do this type of work because I I dread to think how hard it would have been to. Um, to get all, well, to get some of my Lego all the way over to Vienna um, and be able to do similar sort of work. So I was quite glad that I had access to all, all my bits and pieces um, this year and last. Um, and yeah, if you want to find out more about my work, so I primarily put stuff on uh, both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and the main other kind of part of my uh, my artwork is I make Lego stop motion movies. So uh, build a set, move a, move a figure at a time, small increment, take a photo, do it again, do it again. And so I've done a, a variety of different ones on both my, my recent PhD research, but then I've also uh, had a couple of commission pieces. So I did one for the environment agency about things that live in lakes. And I've done some for the astrobiology uh, open university research group. Um, so yeah, they're they're on YouTube if you want to go and go and check them out. Um, but yeah, I've I thoroughly enjoyed being part of the the artist in residency program at EGU. I wish it had been in person for some reason uh, for in some parts, but um, yeah, there were there were advantages to being able to take <laughs> take images in my pajamas at home. Um, but yeah, and then this is a. A little, a little leaving shot of of the the, the four artists from this year. So I will, uh, I will leave it there, and I guess we can move on to questions. Excellent, thank you, Stacey. Um, I'm immensely jealous of your Lego collection. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So now we can move on to questions. I've got a few uh, sent over to you. The one thing, actually, this is more for me than anyone else. Um, it really popped into my head was you're all researchers um, but also artists I was wondering how do people respond to your science art compared to typical science communication methods like a presentation um, I suppose is it a different audience uh, should this be something you would be considering what other researchers should be considering um, uh, Kelly you Given you kind of, I suppose, worked with that with your game, perhaps you might be able to start with an answer for that little. Um, how's the best way to explain? Um, so I'd say that people like they don't think about the art when they look at science and stuff, even though the two are obviously interlinked throughout history. I mean, if you look through like journals such as, you know, like, um, What's it called now? <laughs> like the Royal Society transactions and stuff like that, like the oldest journals, there's always artwork there, like depicting, you know, what they've discovered, like, you know, setups of various like, contraptions they've made to carry out the experiments and things they've observed. I mean, look at, you know, Charles Darwin on his Beagle missions. So it's very interesting when people, you know, interact with your sci art projects and I'm like, oh, I never thought of science and art together. And it's like, well, it's, it's there, it's always there. So yeah, I find it really interesting how the two seem to be, you know, treated as two separate entities when they're very much the same. And I'd say even through like the methodology, they're very much the same, the process of creating stuff and figuring things out, like it is quite the same as well from doing both sides I, I find that you know the experimental process it, it kind of overlaps and it's shocking how similar the two are even though you know 
art and science are treated as these two different things. So that's quite interesting. And I also find that the art is extremely good at attracting people from outside the science, people who are, you know, like afraid, quote unquote, of like scientific subjects and topics and stuff like that. You know, they seem to like think because of stereotypes, oh, you have to be like this extremely clever Einstein figure to get involved with STEM when it's not the case. I mean, anyone can be involved in science. Like it, it, it's not, it shouldn't be sub subjected to a specialized group. And I find that the art is extremely good at breaking down that barrier and making people, you know, the public relaxed enough to actually approach these subjects and then ask questions about these subjects without you know, feeling, you know, nervous about asking things as well. Um, so yeah, I find that's quite good. I've seen that in a multitude of different like mediums, whether it's painting, drawing. Uh, I do these science communication sculptures. I found that they're extremely good at getting random people off the street to approach out curiosity and then get into the subject presented on the sculptures. It's just, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting yeah, question. So I suppose it really kind of helps with engagement by making it more approachable, but mm. also there's quite a lot of similarity between science and art in that they both engage that area of the brain of that deals with abstraction. Mm, yeah. That's both quite creative. Because it's often that I do find, if I always get that question of, are you more creative or are you more scientific? Well, actually they- All scientists are creative. Yeah, quite. And it's weird how people don't realise that. I mean, you need you need like creativity in order to, you know, be good at science. Otherwise, you'd just be rehashing what other people have done. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um I I did actually get a question put in, which is asking why to bring science and art together. But you answered that quite well as well. Um to help to kind of communicate science and reached out to different audiences mm. um one of the question i think this could be for anyone really is uh what advice do you have for people interested in creating science art but who are undrawn how to get started um maybe priyanka would you like to like comment you seem to have a lot of sure. uh, projects mm -hmm. in the yeah i think i've started almost making a career out of science art. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's not evident in the beginning to find projects and it's quite, it can be quite daunting or intimidating to see people because already finding projects in science is difficult and getting funded for it. And now on top of that, if you want to add art to it, yeah, it can be quite, uh, quite a challenge. I would just say, yes, just attend uh, events and see who are the artists in these events. That's how I got started, for example, in the space community. I was looking for who are the people who are actually doing any sort of art in the space uh, domain. And if some of them were scientists or engineers, and turns out half of them are, in fact, scientists and engineers, uh, which can go back to the first question, which is, yeah, you need to be creative to be a scientist. and art, I feel like a lot of people attach the quality of graphical art to art, but even musicians are artists. And there's so many um, Nobel laureates who were excellent violinists or pianists. And it's really in your genes, I guess, or the way you've trained your brain. So to look for, it's, it's like in any other domain, if you want to look for opportunities, the first step is to look for them. And also not hesitate. And also it's like, it's not a set community, it's not a community with set guidelines. It can be, any, it can be, a, it can be working with Lego and, <laughs> and uh, being an artist. So you, you don't, you can, you can use any form of expression you want and um, yeah, just be creative about that as well, I guess. Yeah. So really just, I suppose, go with what clicks for you and then look for opportunities or events for you to engage with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least in my case, I really like 
art. And so for me, science was actually just a medium for creating more artwork. So. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I feel like when I talk about science art, a lot of it is art is the medium for science communication, but actually it can be the other way around as well. Yeah. Um, and that kind of, I suppose, leads on nicely to another question. Um, it's about trying to create a platform for yourself with social media or Twitter. A lot of stuff I see on Twitter about uh, research through um, comics, but also through TikTok and stuff like that. And I was wondering if there's anyone has any advice about provide, creating a platform on social media to you, where you are science communication more generally, or maybe just art. I yeah, just I can... post. <laughs> just <laughs> post everything, talk to people. Uh, you know, just all the various like science communities that are on there. Talk to people. Uh, ask if it'd be interesting collaborating. Um, I find just like having fun with it and collaborating with these scientists is probably the best way to just jump into it. And I don't know. Just don't. Don't take it too seriously because then the fun kind of goes out of it. Make sure you're having fun when, while you're doing it because I find that the best artworks come out of you when you're having fun most. Yeah, sorry, I accidentally cut Stacey off. I'm <laughs> carrying no, on. No, no, that's fine. No, that, that was pretty much what I was going to say. I was just like, yeah, people get, get really... <laughs> no, people, people get really het up about like the first thing they post on social media or they get really anxious about it. And it's like, no one's going to see the very first thing you put out. You just need to keep making stuff and you keep practicing and you get better by practicing. And like, so the the way that I got into all of this, so I, I, I don't feel like I'm an artist. Like I feel like the other three are artists. I don't feel like an artist. I just take photos of Lego figures. Like that feels, doesn't feel like the same league. But I, I, I started on, on Instagram and I've got a modest following on Instagram. Like I'm not a, I'm not a social media influencer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I just took photos of, of Lego figures. I followed hashtags and found that there was this entire community out there, which was, has been amazing and so welcoming and stuff. And then, you know, I, I, I got into kind of doing science communication stuff during my PhD. And I was like, wait, I've got this entire audience who were, you know, a pretty broad spectrum of people from all across the world who aren't necessarily scientists. And I can sneak science into my feed by taking a picture of a Lego figure on a rock. And then I can describe what the rock is. And then suddenly I've got this, I've got access to this audience that actually sci scientists trying to get access to the general public is a really hard thing to do. And I accidentally found that I had access to the general public. And then from, and that was how this sort of stuff evolved. It was just like, yeah, no, you can represent a lot of things in Lego and it may as well be science. And then it's engaging for them. It's engaging for researchers as well. The amount of, like I have presented at a conference before and somebody has told me off for not including Lego in my poster. They were like, <laughs> where's the Lego? So like it works both ways, um, but yeah, I I I'd, I'd say yeah for for people wanting to start, just start. It's the hardest thing, but just just get going, give it, yeah. give it practice and have fun with it. No no, you don't know where it's going to take you. So would you call yourself a Lego civil engineer then? <laughs> Seeing as you're building stuff, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Well, pe people ask me that as well, and I'm like, I'm rubbish at building stuff. They're like, go on Lego Masters. I'm like, no, no, no. I I have one figure in front of a tiny little thing that I've built. That is a whole other thing. <laughs> you um, build a house out of Lego. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as long as it's Lego, I can build anything. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I suppose also with social media, even as you develop online, as you build an audience, you're on a journey for you as well. So it's not all about trying to put it out there. It's about creating a journey with that community with you. Um, and I suppose that kind of also goes to another question is what's the key challenge for communicating science art, or I suppose even art through science? Um, 
Andy, you you touched upon some of these challenges in your talk with your writing. Did you like to expand uh, on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, so the key barrier I come up against is um, scientific language, which is jargon filled and dry and incredibly difficult for anyone who isn't a specialist, even in that subject area, to interpret. So I think that's the, that's the, the, that's the key aim of what I do and the key barrier that I come up against. Um, yeah, I, I, in terms of other barriers, I can't really think of too much, you know. The beauty of art is that it is free for everyone to try and make their own interpretations of things. Um, yeah. yeah, I suppose that's one of the key differences really is trying to make something that is accessible due to its language more accessible due to the freedoms of art. Um, yeah, um, so one of the pieces that I wrote, um, TJ Young, who's the president of the EGU Cryosphere section, challenged me to write something about his research because he uses uh, birefringent wave rotation to look at um, shear margins within ice sheets. Uh, using radio glaciology. Now, to a lot of people, that means absolutely nothing. Uh, to me, uh, even as a geophysicist, it means reasonably little. And to understand his work, thankfully, because he is a good communicator of science, I was able to take his work and begin to understand it um, and then convert that from something dry and jargon heavy to something a bit more creative and fluid um, and hopefully a bit more emotive. Um, so I guess that's kind of one of the aspects as well. Like it's easier to work with people who are good science communicators as pure scientists as well. Yeah, so a researcher looking to try and find a bigger audience for the research or probably need to kind of also work on how they engage with other creatives and other scientists in order to effectively yeah. do that. Yeah, sure. It's just different streams of creativity. Yeah. Um, so I've got one final question, and it was just asking how, um, because the last two general assemblies have been online, it's how has producing art on a digital platform in Chai briefings compared to um, what it's like for when perhaps we can try to keep it more environment. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of an open question as everyone's had to adapt um, to the change. But although Stacey, you did also mention by a menu, like, a lot of Lego around, so I guess it's been uh, positive for you in that end. Yeah, it's been interesting because, yeah, I, I, I have attended uh, EGU the, the two year like in 2018 and 2019 so I'd, I'd been there and I'd seen how the other the, the other artists who have been there had you know had a space and you can go up and approach them or you've got you know a poet roaming around going to various different talks and stuff and so when I originally applied for it that's what I imagined I'd be doing I'd have a have my little corner and people would come up to me and then I could, could just walk into a random hall and be like oh that's yeah I'll make that in Lego whereas actually I I think yeah being able to approach people on Twitter which was the medium that I was going to be putting them out on anyway um that kind of removed a bit of the barriers of a me contacting somebody else if I you know was scared of going up to somebody I could just shoot them a message and they could just do the same to me as well so yeah I I I feel that in a lot of ways, this was kind of the perfect time for me to have, have done this, but I do miss the fact that I, I didn't have my own space, you know, in Vienna where people could just walk by and be like, you know, rifle through the bricks with me and help me physically build something, um, which would have been a nice thing as well. But yeah, I, I, I'm quite happy, yeah, strangely happy with how it, how it turned out in the end, unfortunately. I'll just quickly, like, I think for me, conversely, I think, I struggled to see how I would do it in person um, because basically I 
uh, very fortunate enough to live in the Highlands. So I took myself off in my van and parked in a very quiet spot and wrote poetry there. Writing poetry in uh, a conference center where there's loads of people all the time might be quite difficult. So I'd have to think about that one in the future. Right, so we, we've hit our time limit. So we're gonna have to say goodbye. Um, so first I want to thank you everyone for attending, especially for the panelists to take this time out and show off all the art they created at the... Um, I'm looking to create a monthly uh, webinar series where we host and talk one-on-one with a science artist. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be advertised for our social media channels. I'd like to remind everyone that um, this video will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube, our, our U Geosciences channel, if you want to look and go over it. Guys, that's everything. Uh, thank you to all our artists for attending.